it's because for some years we and others working on global hunger including many national governments were really effective in chipping away at hunger rates and we were bringing hunger down to what we hoped would be the zero hunger goal of the UN meaning no hunger by the year 2030 it's pretty clear now that's not going to happen over the past few years each year we've seen hunger rising uh, so a significant and very disappointing change in that trend right now there are about 690 million people hungry in the world so what's changed to make that trend um, go in the wrong direction it's what i call the three c's conflict climate and covid now on top of conflict and climate crises we have covid covid is making the poorest of the world poorer and the hungriest of the world hungrier before covid we estimated there were about 135 million people acutely hungry in the world meaning people who literally don't know where their next meal is coming from and we estimate now that that has almost doubled to about 270 million because of covid not entirely because of the health impact of the disease the epidemic but the economic impact things like significant drops in remittances which make it very hard for people to to procure food it is very difficult to declare um so a famine requires um evidence of um uh severe um food insecurity certain rates of malnutrition as well as mortality rates and in a conflict zone like yemen it's actually very difficult to get that um that kind of level of evidence which is um possibly one of the reasons that it has not been declared but we shouldn't be waiting for that the fact is that right now um you know people are dying of hunger in yemen and so the time to act is 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 now and we certainly cannot wait for a second so conflict is the main driver of, of the hunger crisis uh, in Yemen. Uh, six years of war now. Um, war has devastated infrastructure. It's destroyed agricultural land. It's eroded government services and it's left the health system on its knees. The toll on children in Yemen is catastrophic. Around half of all children under five in Yemen face acute malnutrition in 2021. So the um, impact of malnutrition on Yemen will be felt for, for, for generations to come. And I think, and that is quite important as we think about how we address uh, the situation in Yemen, is to think, you know, this is the generation that Yemen needs to rebuild when peace finally comes. India as you know, with 1.3 billion population has a distinction of being the country with the largest population of food insecure people. So in terms of numbers, we have the largest number of food insecure people. Uh, in terms of some more figures that I would like to give you here is that uh, India accounted for 22% of global burden of food insecurity, the highest for any country between 2017 and 2019. So in terms of numbers and percentages, you see that we have the largest and sheer largest numbers of people who are uh, food insecure. So that was the scenario we were in before pandemic. And then pandemic hit us in last uh, January fab. And this was a double kind of a uh, stress for people already struggling with poverty, economic crisis, marginalization and many other reasons which were giving them less food to eat. When uh, when lockdown happened last year during March, in April, it's a, it's a reaping season in India, harvesting season. So there were disruption to food chain, uh, supply chains, which has affected more than 100 million people and their incomes. People were not able to harvest their uh, uh, crops in time. So this has affected badly to their income for that year. Um, I have to start by saying uh, to my colleagues uh, that uh, the face of hunger in Central America has changed. And uh, I get that, I'll get to that in a minute. And the reason for that is that uh, since 2014, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua have been experiencing 
prolonged periods of droughts and excessive rains uh, that actually destroy the crops and the livelihoods of, uh, of farmer families. And this is a region where poverty, inequality, and climate shocks are at the root causes of food insecurity. So the situation was improving. You know, we had a um, few rains uh, at the end of 2019, but then in March 2020, we had uh, the pandemic. Uh, of course, you know, rural pandemics um, have been greatly impacted, but also urban communities. That's why at the beginning I said that the, the face of hunger had changed because in the, in the past, we were only focusing on the dry corridor where rural farmers live, but now because of the pandemic, hunger has expanded not just to rural areas, but also to urban areas. I have to say that why it's been so hard for, for the communities in urban and rural areas, because 50% of the labor in Latin America and in Central America as well, it's uh, informal labor, I mean, informal economy, people who work on the streets, people who work, uh, you know, for a few hours in a day and they get paid. And uh, that even goes up to 70% in some countries. So what happened with the COVID restrictions, with the lockdowns, people could no longer go out to do, you know, to do their jobs, their day-to-day -day jobs. So they were having really a really hard time. They couldn't meet their basic needs. They couldn't bring any money to, the, uh, to their families. So I have to say that um, all these issues of food insecurity, you know, climate change and the COVID came at a really bad time. We were really praying, at, you know, when COVID hit, that we were really hoping that the hurricane season will be a quiet one, as we had a few years ago, but that was not the case. As Steve mentioned at the beginning, and in, in, I will also mention, we want to work with the communities and help them become resilient to climate change. Right now, besides COVID, the biggest challenge, the biggest threat they have to the livelihoods, it's, uh, it's climate change. That in that light, we're making an appeal um, which is important for journalists to understand, to the world's exceptionally wealthy people to help us close that gap. About $10 trillion in global wealth is held by just about 2,200 people, all billionaires. And given that some individuals with net worth in the billions significantly increased their personal net worth during COVID, at a time when many others were suffering greatly and unexpectedly, um, we're appealing to those remarkably wealthy people to appreciate the, the dramatic difference they could make in saving lives by contributing even a small part of that and even just once.